everybody. I'm Gigi Hyland. I'm the executive director of the National Credit Union Foundation. Welcome to another Field Notes episode. I'm so excited to have Jeff Chen, who is the VP of Product Management at Alchemy Technology with us. Welcome, Jeff. It's great to have you. Thanks, Gigi. It's great to be here. Yeah, great to, great to talk to you. So um, Jeff and I had a conversation in 2020 as we were talking about financial well-being and we were talking about e-banking and digital strategy and that conversation felt like it was a really great subject matter to bring you on a field notes episode episode and really try to capture it so jeff let's just kind of start with the basics why does alchemy actually have financial wellness or well-being as part of its um eight strategic priorities what's driving that sure yeah it's, it's actually a, a pretty straightforward answer um it's important to our customers so as, as we talk about digital banking and we try to understand what digital banking's true purpose is, it's, it's really a tool to help our customers um, accomplish their goals, which we broadly define as onboarding, engaging, and securing uh, their customer, their member relationships. So um, just talking through them, and it, you, you just look at the mission statements of, of the community banking industry, uh, community credit unions, it, it's very focused on this heritage of, of service, you know, historically it's been service, but when you think about what service really means in, in the context of a financial relationship, um, financial well-being is, is one of those value adds that, that, that folks are adding. And what's happening is as folks are, as the engagement is shifting more and more out of the branch and into digital channels, there's a need to take that sense of service and engagement um, into digital. And that's kind of being wrapped up right now as financial wellness as, as, as a broad topic that captures that, 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 that shift over in, into digital. So. You know, it's something that that we feel our our, our customer base has, has always been passionate about. Um, it's how they've probably um, always differentiated against the the big banks. You know, around the corner is is that extra um, care for the end user and financial wellness is what we call that from a digital banking standpoint. And so, how does that actually translate? Because a lot of people might think of financial well being as you know me going to the branch, potentially meeting with a financial coach. Uh, in person or a member service rep and really having that conversation around where I am in my financial life right now and mm -hmm. how do you help me get to the place I want to go. So what does that look like in the context of digital banking and what, how is Alchemy working on that specifically? Yeah, it's great. It's, you set up great GG. The, um, the, the fundamentals aren't, aren't different. It's that same exact concept, mm -hmm. but the digital channels and tools allow us to, I'd say maybe supercharge that experience, modernize uh, that mm -hmm. experience. Uh, so a couple examples, um, as we've you know, gotten a, a more, I'd say, so sophisticated, uh, almost scientific understanding of financial wellness, one thing we understand is our, our, you know, that we, we, can, we can look at the data to help make the user experience better. So, so, so one topic um, is around um, spending and income volatility. Uh, what, kind of what, what we know is that folks who tend to struggle with financial wellness also have incredible, you know, an incredible, incredible amount of complexity within their, their financial lives. Uh, that means different income streams, uh, different payment streams. And what digital banking can do is to kind of analyze all these transactions over time, uh, leverage technologies like machine learning and AI to kind of smooth that curve out. So it's, 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 it's easier for them to tolerate the, um, the, the ins and outs of, of this financial volatility that can sometimes lead to overdraft and, and, and things like that. Um, another example that pivots off um, really well your example is, is, is video engagement. So just like we're doing Zoom right now, right. Um, even, you know, even pre, you know, uh, pre-pandemic, I think post-pandemic, this has just been accelerated, but using the digital channel as, as a preferred method to, to have deeper engagements about you know, topics around financial coaching, um, finding the products that are right for that particular uh, user, um, helping them with credit score, um, monitoring and advice. So digital banking is also you know, a great storefront for that type of engagement um, that traditionally has happened um, in the branch. I took a note here. And the third one is, oh, of course, um, we, we can also use this to really, um, um, from a data standpoint, um, do much more sophisticated um, benchmarking of financial wellness. So you know, Alchemy works closely, as do many of our customers um, and credit unions, with the Financial Health Network. Yes. And you know, a couple of years back, they launched the Financial Health Score which is a, you know, an, an eight part survey that's trying to not only collect the, help a single person assess their financial well-being, but do so at a broad North American level. So we're getting lots of institutions participating in this. And then we're, we're, drive, we're participating in research and, and benchmarking that over time. So we've got several customers who are um, using a, a survey that we've launched through the digital channel that just has that wider reach. So we can go and, and kind of get that information and, and give people um, 
you know, help FIs take a more quantitative view as, as to how they can help um, the financial wellness of, of their users. That's really interesting. Let's let's pause on that for a second because I think for our listeners, you know, the this idea of financial wellness and financial being can be a little intimidating. And you know, you have to start with this idea of what's the definition. And you just refer to the Financial Health Network. I know Alchemy is a is a member, and a, as is the the National Credit Union Foundation. And um, the Financial Health Network, you know, has this great methodology and survey that really talks about how consumers save, spend, borrow, plan. Um, similar, but a little different to what the CFPB, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau has in terms of capacity, control, choice, and goals. So I don't want our viewers to necessarily be confused by that. The point is that you want people to be on a road to essentially advance their financial life, however they want to advance their financial life. And so what you said, if you can dive just a little deeper, as you, as you work with a financial health network and you embed their financial health survey into the digital banking space, you know, what, what does that look like? Because I think, I think credit unions think, well, how am I going to collect information and data on my members? How am I going to do that? And maybe walk us through how you've worked with a financial health network and are piloting uh, and using their survey to be able to, to grab that data regularly to inform financial institutions, including credit unions, mostly credit unions, what they can do better for those members. Yeah, yeah, great question. Um, so it's, it's really a partnership. You know, yeah. uh, Alchemy specialty is going to be around, obviously, the digital channels, mobile engagement, yeah. things like that. And the Financial Health Network, they're focused more on the research, right? What should the survey be? What are the questions? How do we score the questions? Things like that. So where the partnership comes to life is, you know, we have in the application, it's part of our actual standard platform. So, so any one of our customers can, can turn this on, self-serve. Um, we call it a widget. It, it's, 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 it's a survey that's present, presented to the end user. Um, the way that we deploy it most commonly is through our content system. So usually content is used traditionally, you think about that to promote things like a, a checking account, uh, enroll in e-statements, things like that. But we've got all kinds of interfaces that include interstitial pages, which are a little bit more you know, intrusive in, in terms of the experience. We've also got, um, you know, of course, um, you know, um, cleverly placed, you know, mobile advertisements through the experience, which are, you know, kind of off to the side, but but not in the way of the experience that that folks can 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 have their attention drawn to and, and, and interact with it. Um, alternatively, if FIs really want to promote it, they can actually create a menu item within the application that, drive, that that's called Health Survey and drives right to that. Um, we don't really encourage that one so much because, you know, to your point, users may not know what it means. But by presenting it in, you know, within the experience through our content system. That's really been the most effective way that folks have gotten um, ad adoption and engagement on, on, onto those surveys. Really interesting. Yeah. And then what, in terms of the kind of the longitudinal aspect of this, obviously leveraging Alchemy's digital banking platform to, to see what's happening. In other words, what's the impact that embedding the survey and helping credit unions to make financial decisions based on that data what are you seeing? And I know this is a journey and you're starting it, but sort of what, can you give us some examples of maybe what you've seen already from um, okay. credit unions and maybe the community banking space, wh whatever you think might be relevant as really good examples? Yeah, to be honest with, as, as far as the material gains, we're, we're pretty early on right now. So where we are right now is um, our leading customers, uh, they were benchmarking in 2020. So yeah. their goal was, um, we actually had one customer, I, I won't, I won't um, call them out, but uh, financial wellness is, is a really big aspect of, of their corporate goals and, yeah. and they've got KPIs all around it. And this, they said, hey, you know, we cannot improve what, what we cannot measure, right? And something like financial wellness is, it's a difficult thing to measure, but, but so their 2020 goal, I'd, I'd say they were, they were at the forefront, was to have a KPI, I forget what the exact, exact number was, but was to have a certain number of their members actually go through and complete the survey. So, um, in the same way that they might think that you might think about again a marketing campaign, hey, we want to make sure we get this many impressions or this many yeah. um, you know interactions on a particular advertisement. They took that approach with the survey um, and they hit their goal last year. So I, I wish yeah, I knew the numbers in my head, but yeah, that's awesome. That's so awesome because you know I know when I talk to credit unions and I, I think um, I, I don't want to assume it's true for community banks as well, but certainly when I talk to credit unions, you know we know that credit unions are doing really great work. They do a lot of financial literacy work with their members. Um, they certainly do a lot of, of coaching, but this idea that there's a way to collect quantifiable data to really show that member path of, of betterment on financial well-being is so critical. It's so critical not only 
I think, from a consumer perspective to tell consumers that, hey, we're with you on your financial journey and we can help you. But I think also just to talk to kind of the broader space, whether, and you know, elected officials, advocacy, you can kind of make the whole case for it. So I think as you talk to clients or as you talk to credit unions who are, are looking at your particular product, how are you explaining to them the importance of, of this idea of embedding financial well-being, financial wellness into their digital banking presence? How are you explaining that to them? What's yeah, there's, <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, banks and credit unions, it's interesting on that point. They, they approach it a little bit differently. Uh -huh. um, banks are going to be a little bit more ROI driven. Uh, banks are going to think a little bit more towards, well, you know, we, we've got certain fee incomes and revenue streams that may not be considered financially healthy, right? And then on the credit union side, there's certainly a much more um, direct uh, um, appeal to their core mission statements to, to where it's, okay, well, you know, we're member owned and this is the right thing to, um, to do. So some of the broad things that we talk about to help um, maybe the more, um, the more business case kind of aspects around financial yeah. wellness are things around, um, one thing that we can look at is, uh, we all know there's lots of disruption in the space right now. And so we'll take a company like Chime, for example, mm -hmm. or you can look at SoFi or any of these you know, disruptive yeah. fintechs, neobanks, whatever you want to call them. Um, you look at all these pla the, these um, platforms, you'll notice that they're all differentiating on financial wellness. In, right. in fact, yeah, they're in t their basic value proposition is that the American banking institution, and, and they're mainly talking about the large banks, right? Um, do not care about your well-being. We do. So let us engage you with these great experiences and, and things like that. Um, and, and we're going to um, take care of you. And it's, it's kind of ironic because that, in my opinion, is, is, has been the core mission statement of, of, of our customer base, the, 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 the mid-market um, credit unions and, and banks. Uh, so there's definitely um, competition there. Um, and it's, it's just interesting because you look at something like Chime again, you know, Chime doesn't have bill pay. They don't have these traditional digital banking things that, that, that we've kind of come, become accustomed to uh, within our space. And, and they're really investing in this notion of, of taking care of the member um, or user yeah, for their well-being. So that's, that's, that's one that folks um, tend to respond to uh, pretty well. Um, from a more bottom line driven case, I'll, I'll take that one as well. If, if, sure. if say more of an ROI driven one, what would I yep. like? You know, um, we have to be profitable. We, we have to make money. We have to survive. How does that work? Um, I, I think the most um, famous bu business case is the one from Australia a couple of years back, uh, Commonwealth Bank of Australia. Yeah. yeah. Uh, great research there. Um, they, they gave up, um, I forget the number, uh, I think it's around 50 million in annual revenue of, of what they considered um, kind of non-financial, um, financially unhealthy types of fees and um, practices like that. Right. And then the big bet was that this would organically get out uh, into, the, um, in, in, into the, the, the social realm. It would go viral, this type of approach, and that they would make up for that in terms of um, you know, positive publicity and also uh, new customer acquisition. And they put a forecast out there. Um, no one really knew at the, at the time whether or not that forecast would hit or miss but I believe they met it twice as fast as they actually originally forecasted. So the revenue that they lost through short-term um, punitive fee income, they made up for in uh, new customer acquisition. So a really interesting study and, and one that I'd encourage everyone to check out. Yeah, no, that's a great example. And you know, even though certainly it's too far from our neighbors, um, way, way, way south and west of me um, here in, in, in Alexandria, Virginia, it is such a great example to really show that a, an institution that, that transforms its strategy to be really a financial health provider versus a financial institution um, can, can be incredibly good for business, can, be, can amplify business dramatically if done correctly. So it is a great example. I know it's on the Financial Health Network's website, so we'll make sure to put a link to that example as part of this field notes. Cool. Um, session because I think people should look at that uh, because it's just so informative. Yeah. yeah. And, and even, out, geez, even outside our industry, you, you, you think about a company like, um, like Amazon, right? We, we all like Amazon. Um, Amazon, you know, famously after their IPO had, what was it, 10, 12 quarters of losses, mm -hmm. right? They, they were just, and, you know, the, you know and, and they had all these crazy things that were, you know, we consider crazy ideas back then, like, um, free returns, right? No fees, no shipping fees, all the, all these things that, that, that were 
definitely carry cost. And in our minds, we couldn't understand it, right? And we saw it in their bottom line. But of course, you know, Amazon's mission statement is to be the most customer centric company in the whole world. And clearly that, that investment's paid off, right? So you just kind of think about this, this notion of um, investing first in the customer experience, wh whatever that may be in financial services. Uh, I think there's a really clear connection that financial wellness is, is that customer first, uh, member first type of mentality. Mm -hmm. And you see that paying off when, when consumers love your product, businesses get rewarded. They get rewarded and, and people notice, yeah. That's, that's just, that's the, like the quotable quote of the day, Jeff. I think that idea of, of really that member customer centricity driving ultimately ROI and the success of your, of your bottom line and of your business, you know, is so true. Again, it's been proven out through different case studies, um, but that's, that's really where credit unions certainly should be thinking about as they think about all of these competitive pressures from fintechs yeah. and, and certainly from others. Yeah. Um, what else would you add? You answered my last question in terms of kind of making making this case. What else would you add from a perspective of alchemy and the work you're doing now, but also as you're thinking about the future and you really work on this strategic pillar in alchemy, what, is, what does that look like going forward? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that there's so much to, to uncover here, right? Um, right, right now, the um, if, you, if you go through the, the history of financial wellness activities or endeavors within digital banking, um, you know, uh, in the beginning, we're, we're, I think we're, we're entering probably our, our, our second full generation of this. Right. Um, the first generation was around what was commonly called PFM, you no know, personal finance management. Yeah. And, and uh, the, um, kind of the notion of that was, well, let, let's just go give everyone all the tools that they would need to manage their finances. Let's go give them tools to make budgets. Let's give them tools to categorize their transactions. Let's give them all the tools that they need. And then therefore they can go and, you know, have financially successful lives. Right. right. Well, you know, as, as it turns out that, you know, um, what's it going to, you know, building a lot of gyms, is not just going to, it's not going to make people healthy. Right. right it, exactly. It, it, <laughs> like, it, it turns out you, you need a little bit more than that. Right. So what we're learning now is that you, you've really got to, you know, the way that I talk about it internally is you, you've got to, if financial wellness is, is hard, right. It, it takes effort. It takes discipline. Yes. Um, on behalf and of, it's, of it's longitudinal. There's not like an immediate, you know, uh, exactly. bippy, uppity boo moment. <laughs> right. So I don't know if it's the best example, but the, the one that I've used is you, you, you got to put the medicine in with the food, right? So you, you got to figure out um, what's neat about digital banking is that users have users have to use digital banking because users have to check their balance at, at the very least. Mm -hmm. So if you take this mentality that well, balance inquiry is financial wellness 101. Right. At, at least you're starting someplace and you're trying to be aware and not say overdraft your, your account. And, and that's why you're doing a balance inquiry in general, right? For, for folks who need that. Um, if you can take advantage of, of, of that um, captive audience who, who have to check their balance all the time and, and just try to grow off that experience, but do so in a way where you're pushing insights to the user um, and make it easy for them. So the, the, the trick is to push these insights um, that we learn off their transaction data sets. So, so, so now we've got, um, it's, it's well publicized now, we've got incredibly powerful uh, AI and ML engines where we can learn the behaviors of these users. So we can look at a data set and pretty much know exactly what that person needs to do to increase their savings over time. We, we, can, we, we, we can show you know, where the extraneous spending is and, and we can figure that out scientifically pretty easily, right? Just like a banker could one-on-one -on -one looking at a person's history, right? Yeah. Um, the trick is how do you go and create that sentiment in a way that's very natural for the user without putting a lot of work on them? Because if you put too much work, uh, you fall back into the, the, genera the first generation, which were these PFM tools that kind of force folks to, you know, or, or put folks on, on their own to, to solution it for themselves. So doing things like, like recommendations in, in terms of um, uh, um, recommendations in, in, in terms of, are you sure you want to you know, make this particular financial decision? The other thing that we're also exploring is this concept of um, financial sentiment. So, you know, so much spending happens, especially fast money, the spending that we do very quickly happens in a way where oftentimes when we look back and we think about it, like, oh yeah, that, that, that probably wasn't the smartest thing, but we're in a moment where we just want to spend that way. So one kind of neat idea that we're playing with is um, this idea actually came to us from a, from a very old, um, like early internet um, website that was called, it was about another funny example, it was called Hot or Not. 
but basically it, it, it would show pictures of people and you just rate whether or not you thought that person was, was hot or not. <laughs> but, yeah. But the idea was that the, old, uh, the older version of Tinder, a very exactly old version old Tinder, Tinder, right? <laughs> so I'm dating myself here. But <laughs> but what if we did hot or not with our own transactions history? What yeah. what if afterwards we can flash transactions past people and just ask and, and just ask folks, would you make that transaction again? You know, you, you did before. We can't change that. But would you do it again? And they begin to show insights and say, hey, did you know that you disagree with half of your own spending? Would you like to see which ones you disagreed with in some reform? And to create more of that empathetic emotional connection with spending, because when we're in the moment, when we're you know, you know, at the website, not the mall anymore, but but at the point of purchase, it goes really quick, right? The Starbucks or right. whatever it might be, the drive-through, um, etc. So it's that dis discretionary spending that typically is one of the lower hanging fruits in terms of building building savings, and, and we know that building savings yeah. is is the universal. You know, there is no true cure all, but it is the most universally universally uh, universally applicable advice for really anyone who wants to improve the financial wellness save more money and, and giving folks ideas as to, as to how to do that is 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 what we're looking at yeah so th those are all just it's just fabulous again this is this is work that um you know evolves and that iterates as we go forward with the advancements of technology and, and ai and data which is awesome so I'm going to ask you a question, Jen. Which it's a question prompted by this. Um, so I did. I didn't list it to you ahead of time. So hopefully I'm not catching you off guard. But you know, we talk about all of this opportunity in the digital space, and I cannot help but think about obviously all of the work that's not happening in diversity, equity, inclusion. This idea mm -hmm. of the digital divide of how you reach um, black, brown, under marginalized populations with the ability, the access that they need to essentially get into a place that they can get into a rhythm of improving financial life. And there are these, all of these barriers to that. And I'm just, again, uh, please, if I'm putting you on the spot, let me know, but I'm wondering how is, how is Alchemy thinking of that? And you've got a lot of credit unions that are smaller credit unions or that are maybe low income designated credit unions or that are community development credit unions, um, officially CDFIs that really are trying to build communities and build this idea of financial stability in communities. So, how does Alchemy play in that space, knowing how laser focused you are in the digital space? How do you think about that digital divide? And what, if anything, are you all are doing to try to start to, to bridge, to make sure that it's financial wellness for all, not just financial wellness for those of us that know how to use digital banking on our, on our iPhone? Yeah. Sure. Yeah, there, there's a, um, you know, kind of, the, the, it, it's an interesting question because when we think about, you know, our, our role is to be a tool for our customers yeah. to accomplish their jobs, right? right. right. Um, so if our customers want to be predatory lenders, it's an interesting philosophical question for Alchemy, right? We would say we're probably not culturally aligned. Um, we don't really build products that encourage that, right? But but it's, it's so there's definitely a gray area there, but I'll, I'll say a couple of things on this is that, sure. Sure. you know, one thing that is, um, you know, one thing that the, the, the common point here is, is that every FI wants to grow, right? They're all looking for, 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 for growth opportunities. Uh, right now for credit unions, we see that typically with a uh, small business, that's one area of growth. And also of course, um, the, the underbanked, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the underbanked, well, how are they being served today? They are being served by these more predatory, right. um, uh, cash checking, loan payday uh, businesses. And, and, and those businesses are actually quite profitable. That's why they exist, right? So. So the business case is there, right? The while the savings and while the assets may not be there within that within that that particular um, demographic, um, there's um, there's there's a prosperity to be built within that those those communities, and it's really on our customers if, if that fits with their overall mission or or, or or not. But the things that I point to is that that's the that is the one of the primary targets of 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 of, of these more disruptive of these more disruptive fintechs. You know, they're looking for the underserved. And, and in some ways they're beating, you know, our institutions to the punch there. So one really neat feature that I think that, that I would encourage, that we do encourage you know, our customers to think about, it's, it's more of a banking product, yep. but it's doing things like um, um, payday advances, right? Yep. So if, if you know that uh, a particular, you know, member or customer is, has a steady income, right? Maybe not monthly because they um, have, have a job that's more gig, gig economy based. Maybe yep. it's, um, gardening, maybe it's um, driving for Uber, maybe it's more like a, like a non-steady income stream. But say over the course of a year, 
you can see a trend there, right? Um, you know, I, I think credit unions have opportunity to decide, hey, like, like, are we willing to disrupt our notions of risk, right? And, and how we understand, you know, income flow and things like that and do things like advanced paydays before they, before, you know, before the funds actually hit because we know in the long run that money's coming in. Um, if you look at a company like PayPal, that's how PayPal built their entire business. Um, they made HCH real time just by taking on the risk themselves because they knew the users would be good for the money eventually, right? Um, you know, maybe not, right? That, that's how they made HCH um, real time. Um, at, at least a real time experience for the folks who are actually um, transacting through a batch uh, network like, like ACH is what I meant to say there. Yeah. Um, and, you know, again, back to my, I think one of my first, you know, kind of ideas here was that this idea of income and expense volatility being, it, it's an incredibly complex calculus for the mind to work out in terms of balancing it. You know, many of us probably on this call are fortunate enough to not be at zero balance. So that volatility doesn't really matter because we're not at zero. But if you're close to zero balance, that volatility is extremely impactful because it leads to overdraft and things like that. So anything that FIs can do to smooth out that income curve will then help manage that expense curve. So, um, but, but these are more innovative banking products that I, I would really encourage our customers to, to look and think about uh, the, in the in industry as a whole, not, not just our customers, because there's a, there's a great opportunity there. No, that's really helpful to hear. And I think what's, what's important to underscore what you just said is that, you know, these, um, these tools are available now. So that's not, we're not, we're not looking like 10 years into the future. These tools are available now for credit unions to use. And, you know, obviously, yes, they come at a cost, but we're also a cooperative movement. So there might be options um, to cooperate to, you know, to lower, lower the cost, but they're available now to give insights and also to give access, I think, to, to people who might be marginalized uh, in the banking system to, to have that sort of open door to, to have a methodology of smoothing out income and making sure that the stress associated with the income dips gets, gets reduced. Because we know, we know from behavioral science that the ability to make logical decisions around your finances when you are that completely stressed out um, gets absolutely blown away, gets washed away. You just don't have that logic to be able to make good informed solid decisions like we do when we're in a place of um feeling comfortable and feeling okay with our finances so um yeah. really great great information yeah so what's the, what's the last word i know we're wrapping up on time but what's the last word for our credit union audience that's listening um any other uh, parting words of advice for them no i i think we're, we're at a really neat time right now overall because um you know i've been in this in working with credit unions for you know 15 years and um, you know, maybe I'm naive, but I've, I've come to genuinely, genuinely believe that, 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 that this community really cares about the success of, of, the, of their members, right? Mm -hmm. And of course, part of that is the ownership structure, obviously. And um, part of it's the culture that's kind of been built off of that um, over, over the years. And what's really neat right now is that I think business is rewarding that. They're, they're, they're rewarding the companies who truly take care of the consumers. And, and you see that in Amazon, uh, we talked about that earlier. Um, you're also, but you're also seeing, uh, we're, we're seeing in the, in, in the disruptive fintechs, but you're also going to see, you know, I predict the mega banks start to also react in, you know, in this way as well. So just as uh, there's a point in time where there was a digital gap, right? And the mega banks were kind of behind there and got caught up really quickly. Um, I think the mega, this window won't last forever. I think um, the mega banks are also wise to this and they're going to see, um, the ROI, quote unquote, on 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 doing the right thing for the consumer. So it's a it's 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 a bit of a race there, right? But I, I think that right now, as a as it pertains to the um, the 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 general you know American demographic and how they view community based institutions versus more national or federal institutions, trust still sits sits within the community, right? Um, and we still value these ideas of things like financial choice, right? We, we want these many choices. It's, it's a very American value. Um, so I would really lean into that right now because we're at a spot right now where, where business seems to be rewarding that. You don't have to prove the bottom line right away. Um, as long as you're taking care of that customer, it, it, it's, it's going to come full circle. So I really just lean into what has always made this industry special, which is, you know, just look at your mission statement. I don't, I don't have to know what it is. I know generally what it is. Right. Do that. Yeah. 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 That's fabulous. What a great way to close out this conversation. And Jeff, it's it's been such a delight 
to talk to you, you know, obviously from a very different lens than credit unions maybe normally hear on these types of conversations, but what a great far ranging uh, way of thinking about digital banking and financial well being and the intersection of those two as a way to really ultimately help people with their, with their finances. So really great stuff. So thank you for being with us. I appreciate it. And thanks for all the great work that you and Alchemy are doing in the space and for all your leadership. Yeah, thank you, Gigi. It's been a pleasure. Mm -hmm.